So, the chains of, of the bondage to sin had wrapped around my heart at a very young age. I remember um, the most awkward bus ride of my life was when my mother had come to the realization that her whole oldest son was a thief. You see, the first time I brought home a toy with the story that I wanted as a merit prize, my mom believed it. And the second time I brought another toy with the same story, she must have started thinking that I'm the biggest te teacher's pet, right? But by the time I got to the fourth and the third toy, the same story, <laughs> my mother must have started wondering, you know, why does this teacher's pet, you know, sound like a rat? And so my mom called me out in it. And um, in deep shame, I told my mom I'm going to return everything. And that episode in my life started teaching me how depraved I was. And I never understood, for the life of me, I never understood what was compelling me to take things I didn't need. I didn't lack for toys. And the things I stole weren't even things I really wanted. But there was a yearning in me. I desperately wanted to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I desperately longed to hear an approval. I was desperate for a benevolence approval in my life. And so I was willing to do anything to fabricate it, even to play act as if I had won merit and brought it home. And so I was, I was found out, I returned those things, and the depravity that was in my heart had now another chain of shame that I would carry through, through my life. And the reason I share that is because as I was trying to unpack uh, the, the, the passage of scripture for today, it really gave me a, uh, it helped me to get an understanding of what God had done in my life when I started to understand the gospel. So today we're going to talk about wisdom, and we're going to talk about the power of wisdom. And James is going to give us a test about the two types of wisdom that are in, that are, that are in existence. And which, which one is animating us? And as, a, and as a little boy, in my desperation to find life, I laid hold of anything I could get a hand on. And in my ignorance, and in my folly, I found myself ensnared. I wanted to be a hero, but I was literally a villain. I wanted honor, I found shame. So today we're going to look at James chapter 3, verse 13 and verse... Uh, to verse, verse 17. But before we go there, I need to tell you guys a story about how um, about, hunt, about hunting monkeys. So, there's a story I heard years ago about how, how they hunt monkeys. So the way they hunt monkeys is they, um, apparently, is they put nuts in, in, um, in like devices that have like maybe like a bottle with a long neck long enough that the monkey can stick their hand in. And they would put a nut in there, and they would maybe tie the bottle to a tree, or they would tie like a, like a, some sort of like calabash thing into a tree, and when the, the monkey would find the nut in there, and the monkey would stick his hand into the, into the narrow entry, and he would lay hold of the, of the, of the nut. But when the, once the monkey is laying hold of the nut, his hand is in a fist, and they can't pull it out and get their hand out of the, out of, out of the hole. And so what do you think the monkey would do? The monkey would let go of the nut, pull his hand out, and he would tip it over. But monkeys won't do that. Monkeys can't get themselves to reason that they would need to let go of the nut, what they have laid, laid hold up onto, in order to find their freedom, and to come, come up with another way to get the nut out. And so what the monkeys would apparently do is they would just hold onto this nut, and they would literally lose their mind, raving mad, trying to yank out the nut. And the hunters who are trappers would just come to these monkeys and just throw a net over them and catch them. And I remember when I heard that story, I thought about my depravity and the bondage that had been in my heart and how as I was searching for things that I thought would fulfill me, I found myself ensnared. And I couldn't let go of those things, even though I felt trapped. And I remember what I did share with you guys is how twisted the story of my, of my kleptomania was. 
is that when I, when I promised God that I would return the things that I had stolen, I didn't, I didn't do it through repentance. What I did is I went and I hid everything. And then I came up with a new narrative. I took those things and I brought them to people and I said, I, they were lost, but now I found them. And I remember the day one of those, one of those little, little girls came to me when we were kids, and I think she gave me a hug or something and she thanked me. And I remember thinking at that moment how deeply ashamed I was. And so I walked through the shame all my life, and it wasn't until I understood the gospel that Jesus Christ started helping me understand what it was that I was yearning for, and that there was wisdom to attain life that didn't leave you trapped. So wisdom is the power to lay hold of life. The world is created by through wisdom, through the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the power to lay hold of life. Wisdom gives us the power to touch the robes without being tricked and dying. Wisdom is the power to lay hold of life. Today, James is going to give us a test as to which wisdom is animating us. Because there is a wisdom that leads to life, and wisdom that makes us competent for living, and there's a wisdom that ensnares us, a counterfeit wisdom. And right now, both of those wisdoms are appealing to us. One wisdom is from above, and one wisdom is from below. How do we know which kind of wisdom is shaping our life? And how can we escape the, deceit, the deceitful logic of sin that holds our mind captives? How do we break out of the monkey trap? So James writes to the church, and he poses this test about wisdom. And James doesn't want you to tell him, tell him about your wisdom. He wants you to show him your wisdom. All through the book of James, the, the thing that marks the book of James is integrity. Integrity is that the abstract moves to imprint itself on the concrete. That which is invisible moves to imprint itself on that which is visible. And James doesn't want you to tell him what your wisdom is. He wants you to show him your wisdom. Because the book of, of, book of James is all about integrity. The test of wisdom is not eloquence of words. The test of wisdom is eloquence of life. So let's read James 3, the 13 to 17 together. Who is wise in understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. According to James, there is one specific, unextricable characteristic that attends wisdom. Meekness. Meekness according to James, is the embodiment of wisdom. And before we talk about why it is that meekness is the embodiment of wisdom, I want us to understand what actually meekness itself is. So meekness, misunderstood by the world, is not weakness. Those are different things. Meekness is not shyness or timidity. Meekness is power under control. One of the best descriptions someone ever gave me about meekness is to say, imagine a horse the horse is stronger than its rider. Its, 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 its muscles are, are like tense and they're like they're phenomenal. The beast is huge. It can crush the it can, it can crush the rider any moment. But the but the beast yields its strength to the rider to, to serve the rider. And Brian Williams told me that that's a picture of what meekness is. Meekness is power orientated towards service. One of the greatest men I believe I ever lived was Moses. And he grew up and he was taught in the, the sciences and the communication arts of, of the, the Egyptians. And Moses decided that he would leave the trappings of, of Egypt to go and suffer humiliation with the people of Christ because he thought that was of more value. He believed it was wiser to suffer with the people of Jesus Christ than to enjoy the trappings of Israel. And the Bible says of Moses, he was the meekest man on the face of the earth. This was a man that would go up to Mount Sinai 
where even animals were not allowed to touch the mountain because if they did that, they would die. People were trembling, and they said, Moses, you go, you go and speak with God, but we can't bear to behold God. And it says that Moses would go up the mountain, himself trembling, but he would go to God so that he could secure a, a people for God. He disposed his, his soul for the purposes of God. And the Bible says that, that is what meekness looks like. Power, gifting, ability, intellect, orientating for the purposes of service. That's what meekness is. All of you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take upon me my yoke and learn from me, for I am meek and I am lowly in spirit. Jesus does not call people to himself because he is meek. He calls people to himself because Jesus coming onto the earth was God moving his power and orientating it towards service. And so Jesus says the Son of Man did not come to be served, but he came to orientate his power towards <coughs> serving. Jesus came to orientate the power of God towards meekness. So power, meekness, are the fruits that come out of wisdom. And Jesus was, was misunderstood as he sought to, pers to pursue the purposes of God. And one of the people that misunderstood him was James, the author of this book. Because the author of this book's name, James, is the brother of Jesus. And when Jesus Christ was crucified and resurrected, James got another understanding of what his brother was and, what, and, what, and, the, and the power that was, that was manifested in Jesus Christ at the cross. And James was in the upper room. When, uh, when Pentecost happened. And James, James became a great leader in the church. And though James was never counted among the apostles, James became the presiding elder over the church of Jerusalem. So when you look at the, the book of Acts, James was like the chairman of the, of the elders. He was presiding over those, over, those, over, those, over those meetings. And it is James who is writing this book and is about to drop some serious knowledge bombs. And how does James who saw this amazing picture of power and meekness, how would James introduce himself? If you turn to James, to James chapter 1, the beginning of this book, you would, perhaps you would imagine that James would say, hey, I'm James, the brother of God, or the half-brother of God. James, the head of the church of, of, of Jerusalem. James, the martyr. James, the just. The way James begins the book, his salutation, is this letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James learned to embody weakness, and that was his qualification to speak about wisdom. Before James wants us to understand, um, before James wants to go further into talking about what it is that, how it is that we can discern um, um, the qualities of wisdom from above and wisdom from below, James wants to make it clear that anything that is not orientated towards serving the purposes of God is selfish and self-centered. And even though it may sound reasonable and logic, its roots are demonic and they're destructive and disorderly. And so James says, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. And the question we ask ourselves is, what is envy and selfishness got to do with wisdom? Envy and jealousy are deceptive motivations, and what they camouflage is a false sense of justice. They're both misplaced sense of justice. Envy starts by saying, you don't have the right to you don't have the right to talk to me like that, look to me like, look at me like that, wear that, do that, be that way. Envy judges others in respect to oneself. So I put myself as a, in the place of a judge, and I judge others, and that's the root motivation of envy. But in, in a, a heart that is envious has left the place of servant and has, put, has taken the place of a judge. But every evil thing that we can, every evil thing that that is done. Um, is done with a justification. 
but a heart of envy is a heart that has left the place of service to, pay, to take the place of judge. And James says, if you have envy, it is coming from a false wisdom, a counterfeit wisdom. Jealousy, likewise, is the application of service to pursue selfish ambition. Sorry, I mean selfish ambition is the abdication of, of service to pursue se one's selfish uh, ambition and one's selfish goals. There is a story, there's, a, there's an article I read about the millennial, millennial um, burnout where it says the, great, the, the, more, um, the motivating factor for millennial burnout is that millennials are busy chasing each other to, to, um, uh, with social media and trying to catch up with each other's careers and looking at what other people are posting and how other people's lives are going and they're constantly just unsatisfied with, with, with like this pecking order and it leads, to, it leads to burnout and what's happening there is a manifestation of jealousy and a manifestation of envy and, they're seeing, and it seems to make sense that we want to get ahead but what James wants to say is that if that's the pattern that's animating our hearts then what we are falling into is a trap of wisdom from below The way we justify selfish ambition is first we convince ourselves that that thing that we want to pursue is God's will. We convince ourselves that what, that, that which we want to pursue is God's will. And we convince ourselves that our own self-actualization, um, above all else, is what's going to serve to glorify God. But it's self-serving and it's not serving to him. And selfish ambition looks, is, looks like being demanding towards others or being aloof towards others as one is consumed with their own self-interest and self-actualization. But these motivations are opposite to true meekness. And as long as these motivations contaminate our hearts, we don't see clearly and we don't have wisdom from above. It clouds our understanding and clouds our judgment. And, I was, and when I was trying to figure out what it was in my heart that compelled me to take those things that were not mine, I never understood that what it was motivating my heart was jealousy and envy. I just didn't understand that. I was puzzled. It wasn't until I understood the gospel that I understood that what I was trying to pursue was self-justification, self attaining for myself approval, putting myself in the place of glory. And it wasn't until I understood the gospel that I started discerning that these were the motivations of my heart that were holding me captive. James says that if, if when we are wrestling with the, with the, um, the temptations towards selfish ambition or towards envy, the last thing we want to do is argue and boast about it. The last thing we want to do is be defensive and try to reason about it because that will only confuse us more. James says that this wisdom is not from above but is earthly and spiritual, demonic, and there will be disorder in every vile practice where selfish ambition exists. James is telling us that when our vertical alignment, when we are not oriented right towards the purposes of God, that will reveal itself in disorder in our, in our relationships, in our community. But every evil thing that is done, is done with a justification. So there was a time in history where people could justify slavery. And people have a justification for killing babies. And there's a logic behind that. But James says that animating, <coughs> what's animating that is not power, is not weakness, is not wisdom. What's animating that is, 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 is wickedness, it's evil. It's unspiritual, it's demonic, and it's of the earth.
Wisdom from above is pure. James lists a bunch of ways to describe wisdom that is from above compared to wisdom from below. Wisdom from above is merciful. Wisdom from above is peaceful. Wisdom from above um, um, leads to good fruit. But he says, first of all, wisdom from above is pure. And the reason that wisdom from above is pure is because of what it, what it, what the purity of the wisdom from above is that it removes self-interest from the equation in order to be able to see clearly from the position of certainty. So as long as self-interest is what we, is, is the center of our universe, as long as we, our self-interest is the thing that we're trying to pursue, everything that we see, every, the way we try to navigate reality is, 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 is wrong from the ground up. The ability to remove our self-interest is what allows us to see cl with clarity in order to be disposed to, disposed to serving. And one of the greatest demonstrations of this discerning wisdom from above and wisdom from below is where when Jesus is heading towards the crucifixion and Peter begins to rebuke him and Peter is telling Jesus, Jesus, you're kind of discouraging the team. <coughs> Jesus, you don't have to go to the cross. We're going to find another way. And in Matthew 16, Jesus says, uh, the scriptures say, from the time Jesus began to show his disciples that it was going to be Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and on the third day rise, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that you shall, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And Jesus told his disciples, If you would come after me, a man must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever would lose his life for my name's sake so will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the world, but forfeits his own soul? Or what shall a man, or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with angels of glory, in the glory of his Father, and he will repay to each according to what he has done. Jesus smelled that the logic that Peter was speaking to him about came straight from the pit of hell, because it was all about self-interest. Peter was trying to explain a way to save the world that would not cause Jesus' life. And Jesus said, that smells, like, that smells like logic from hell. How many of us would be able to discern the flattery and the trap of trying to pursue God's purposes with, self, with our self-interest in the center? The purity of Jesus' thinking is the power he had to remove his self-interest from the equation and look at the situation as a, as a servant. And so Jesus was not looking to advance his self-interest. He came here so that he could save us and that he could fulfill the, the, the will of the Father. Unless the monkey can let go of the nut, it forfeits its freedom. But the monkey can't let go of the nut because he, that's his fulfillment. And it takes wisdom, to be, it takes profound wisdom to understand that sometimes there's the very things that um, we believe will fulfill us, that if we let, let them go in faith, that God will give us a way to lay hold of life with freedom. And Jesus says, for those who are willing to lay down their life, remove their self-interest, and set their, their, set their posture of their hearts and the moral order of their hearts towards meekness and service, they will find understanding. They will find power that comes with from wisdom. And we are set free from our bondages. And we are able to escape the monkey trap. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what was preached to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. 
For the foolishness of God is blinding the men, and the, and the weakness of God is strong in the men. Father, I want to thank you that you've demonstrated your power through the love and rebuke of the cross. Thank you, Father, that though we have left the place of serving, and we thought that we would attain to glory, and we would attain to godliness, and we would attain to knowledge and wisdom by leaving the place of serving, you, Lord, with your mind, having finding yourself as God comes into this world. And you empty yourself and you humble yourself and you take the place of the human servant and you fulfill the will of the Father. And I thank you, Jesus, but by doing that, you have you both rebuked us from the cross and you have spoken love over us. And I thank you, Jesus, that though we are now sons and daughters, we can join Paul and we can join James, your brother, and we can join Jude, your other half brother, who say, though they are sons of God, yet they will live like slaves of God and slaves of Jesus. And I pray, Father, that we would receive the meekness that allows us to let go of our self-interest and our complexes and our obsessions so that we can truly lay hold of life. I pray that we would escape the bondage and the clutches of the deceitfulness of sin in our hearts and be set free. I pray, Father, that we would be able to um, be enraptured by your gospel and see the glory of God as, a pur as the purpose worthy of our lives and give ourselves to that and in that find life and freedom. Jesus, I ask these things in your holy name.